Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That means what? I always ask the kids this. Who knows what it means? Put your hand up. Yeah, go on. Peace to you. Peace to you, blessing and mercy. So it doesn't mean hello, right? <laughs> That's what most people answer, yeah? Okay. It means may the peace, the mercy and the blessings of God be upon all of you. And I mean it sincerely from my heart, okay? And I really do think that it's important that we reach out to one another as human beings. We're on a shared journey. We're on a shared journey, right? We're on this plane. We're on this aircraft. We're on this bus or this coach, and we're just merely fellow passengers of one another. That's all we are. Yeah. So what these guys have told you, and what I'm about to tell you about my life story, my life story hasn't ended anyway. <laughs> Not yet. Don't shoot me dead just for saying that. But the reality is that we are on this shared journey, and we can influence one another. We can help one another. And we didn't choose to be on this shared journey. Because many of us haven't even asked what is the purpose of life. Many of us haven't even right, said, you know, what I'd like to ask you is why should I ask why? You know, why should I ask why? Well, not what's the purpose of life. Why should I ask why? There's good reasons to, to, to ask why. Okay? Now, what I'm going to tell you might give you some sort of insight as to why you should ask why. I'm, I was born as a white. You can see it, I haven't changed. Um, middle class, haven't changed. Um, Irish, Catholic. My, my, of course, my accent has gone because my father ran away from the house when I was four. So he didn't really have that much of an impact on me. Uh, my, my mother actually flew him out, you know, when I was four. Um, my mother was sort of middle class, white from Woking. I was born in Woking. Big shout for Woking, good. Okay. <laughs> That's the home of the first purpose-built mosque, which I, of course I didn't know at the time, right? I was born in the district hospital. Um, my mother and father were so different. You know, they just didn't suit each other. I remember my father, the only thing I can remember of my father was one day he came back and my mother had been telling me, I hate your father. And I remembered this, so I told him. <laughs> I said, Mom, I just said that she hates you and that she wishes you were dead. And that was the last time I spoke to my father. Until 20 years later when I went to find him. You know, at the age of, you know, 15, I ran away from home. Because I didn't really have that much in the way of support from my family. I didn't have a father by that time. My, I had a stepfather who used to beat on me, you know, good old couple of whacks here and there. Good fun it was at the time, I'm sure. Um, but looking back on it, it was all part of the preparation for the journey, you know. And again, some of the journey, some of the passengers on this journey, they're going to give you a couple of slaps, but that makes you think about your own self, yourself. You think, you think about your, you start to think and reflect about your own credentials and your own being. So all of these things, they happen for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. So I remember, you know, like I said, you know, my father used to beat up on me, and then I, I became estranged from the house. I became a punk rocker. You remember those? Sid and Nancy. Of course you don't know anything about Sid and Nancy. Do you know Sid and Nancy? Yes. Yeah, you remember Sid and Nancy? <laughs> remember the bus cops? <laughs> Ever fall in love with someone? Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I didn't fall in love with anyone at that time. Uh, I was estranged. I was, I was out just to rebel. And, you know, I would tell the world by wearing tongue and bondage trousers. As I say, Sid and Nancy were my heroes, you know. And uh, the Damned, the Sex Pistols, the Stranglers, you know. And at that time, in Bristol, that was the scene. We used to go down to Broadmead every Saturday and, you know, just run in groups. For no reason. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? But isn't that what we're all doing in this world? That's what most of us are doing. Running in groups for no reason. Queuing up for no reason. Going to get our degrees for no reason other than to get a house. So we can have children, we can have a beautiful car. Oh, and have two holidays a year. That's what most of us are living. So reality is, me running down Broadmead on a Saturday wasn't much different from what everyone else is doing. 
there we are on the shared journey again. <laughs> you know, asking ourselves, why? Should I ask why? So, after some time, I've left home, I've had 17 addresses. I remember I counted them, 17 addresses, yeah? I went from Hazelmere, yeah, it's Hazelmere, uh, Guildford, Golming, anyone, anyone know these places? Yeah? Uh, anyway, the list goes on. And I started meeting people and I'd just meet anyone and I'd be with them. And I, I would accept what they said, gospel, according to the gospels, yeah? And then, you know, there was a time when, you know, because I have to cut this story short somewhat, you know, it usually takes me an hour and a half to tell you the story, but I only got 25 minutes, 20 minutes. So, there was a time in my life that I became extremely depressed. Extremely depressed because I was just looking out of my window on a daily basis and saying, there's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be more to it. So there was a point when I started to go back into reading. I left school at the age of 15 with no qualifications, yeah? I'd run away from home, and I hated formalized education and schools and stuff like that. But there was something that started to make me think, well, I need to find the real me. So I went back to university. I did an access course, and I did, no, I did a few A-levels, or GCSEs, and then they were called. Is it O levels then? Yeah, O levels, yeah. Ordinary level, that means. We're ordinary, we're not advanced anymore. <laughs> so we, we did those uh, things in the you know, evening school. And then I got on this access course in Lewis Tertiary College, I remember it well. And it took me two years to do it because I kept doubting as to whether I really needed to go and study in a, you know, in a college. I decided anyway I'd go forward. And I went to Sussex University to study politics and third world development. They called it the third world. Isn't it interesting how the world changes? It's now the developing world. <laughs> Semantics. Great stuff. You should study it more often. So there was, you know, the reason I went to university was what? To get a piece of paper so I could get a job. So I could get a house, a wife, because no one would marry me without a job. Was that it? No. I went to study at university to find the top 5% of the world who could tell me what the hell I was doing in this planet. Seriously, that's why I chose university and I chose politics and third development because I thought that it would give me access to the sort of people who thought you know, not the sort of people in LSE, right? <laughs> yeah, <I'm sorry. laughs> no, no. So, there I am, I'm at the university, I turn up, and I, I'm, living off, I'm, I'm living off the campus, you know, I'm thinking, great, where are they? Come and get me, man. Come and find me. Give me the truth, come on. So the first couple of weeks I was very disappointed. Because there were all these 18 and 19 year olds going off for the first time, leaving their homes. Whack! Down the bar. You know what they were doing. You get the picture, yeah? So I was a bit disappointed. Anyway, I found the uh, Institute of Development Studies, which is where all the masters and the PhD students and I started hanging out with them instead. Because I was mature, right, after all? <laughs> mature. Well, that's what I used to think I was, anyway. But, so, I started to hang out with these people, and a lot of them were Indians. So I started getting into Gandhi. You know Gandhiji? Mahatma Gandhi. So I read all of his stuff. And you know, he, he had this passion and this desire, and he believed in something. And, and latterly, I've been reading some of this stuff. Maybe he had some Islamic influences as well. He had some influences from Muslims around him. Anyway, I liked the guy. I thought he was good, so I started acting like him. I used to go back home and see my mum. What's wrong with you? You're speaking with an Indian accent. <laughs> you know, why are you wearing that funny hat on your head? No, it's just uh, this cool dude uh, called Gandhi. Gandhi G. Mahatma. You should be like him, mum. Amazing guy. Anyway, after a few weeks, I was reading Tolstoy. And guess what? I started writing like Tolstoy as well, because I wanted to find. 
I could identify with a person who was passionate, who believed in something, that had a way and had the ability to express that and go out and explain that to other people. And it convinced me. So I was no, a Tolstoy, I was a Tolstoy freak. You know, Tolstoy? Well, latterly, I've been reading that actually he may have died as a Muslim. I have some very, very good links, which I can send you guys, that he was highly influenced by Muslims around him. And he died as a, basically, he just ran off into, uh, I can't remember this, the name of the uh, railway station, and he died there on his own. And he, you know, subhanAllah, he was a, an aristocrat. He had, you know, influence in his country. But yet he was very, very simple. He, you know, he used to serve the poor. And, you know, he really used to think, you know, and, and, and really express himself. And I would recommend all of you to read Tolstoy, by the way. He's, a, he's, the, he's an author which a lot of people have stopped reading. Read Tolstoy, War and Peace. Read, uh, you know, Crime and Punishment is the other guy, so don't read that one. That's Dostoevsky, right? But um, read all of Tolstoy. I read all of his stuff at the time. You know, I've got them all on my shelf. If you want to borrow them, you're more than welcome. So, I, then I started reading Marx. Because I was thinking, there must be a way. So, socialism was the new team. We used to sell socialist worker party papers out in the street. You, see, you know, these middle class people in Guildford. So she's woke up, up the revolution. Then one guy told me, sat down in the pub, he said, like you do, you go to the pub. He sat down with me and he said, look, he said, I said to him, why are you, uh, you know, a Marxist? Why are you, uh, you know, a socialist? Isn't it that you want to change the world? You want to make the poor rich? You want to give everybody an equal right, etc.? He said, no, I just want to... I want to have a bigger house and a bigger car, and uh, I just want the rich to give the money to me instead. So that was one of the leaders of the, the sort of, you know, organization in Guildford. So that really upset me, and I left. Anyway, there I am. I'm in the campus, right? And I'm really, really going for it, hammer on and top. So I meet this person. He's a Buddhist, OK? This is very, very smaller than it should be this talk. Yeah. But anyway, I meet this guy, he's a Buddhist, and he says, this is a fantastic thing you can do. You have to do this meditation, and you have to believe in this stuff, and you have to eat this right food and stuff. So I became a Buddhist. Fantastic, you know, because there was no other way at the time. So I thought, let's become a Buddhist. For three months, I did Buddhist meditation. And then one day, I said to him, you know, there's only one slight issue. What is the purpose of life? And who is God? And what is my role and responsibility in this world? So he thought for a minute, it's just a few minutes, yeah? Never gonna happen. But anyway, do you want me to finish? Please. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know you should change this. <laughs> Sorry, Joseph. Right, anyway, so basically, there's this Buddhist, and they say to me, you know, the real reason for existence is to contemplate the supreme nothingness. Hold on. Run that by me again. To contemplate the supreme nothingness. I said, I can't believe that. I'm, I'm out of here. So I left. I never went back to the Buddhists again. This is a very, very short story, right? Then one day there was a Christian uh, in the campus, you know, and she said to me, come to our event. And then I went to her an event, and fantastic event, beautiful, the people were nice, etc. And then suddenly this guy comes out on the stage. I won't be more than a few minutes. I promise you. Charlotte. You've been in Charlotte. Right. Um, so what happened was, she says to me, come to this event, sit down, the guy comes out on the stage with a guitar, starts playing. You know, the guy comes with the drums, and suddenly everybody is transfixed on this guy, apart from me. You know, so I'm thinking, no, this is my ability, my chance of finding God, maybe. Let me stick with it. You know? I didn't like what I was hearing and seeing. Okay, so then, halfway through it, you know, they started playing the guitars and stuff, and then one guy was pointed to somebody in the crowd. And the guy fell prostrate and started shaking and going into, like, a, like a fit, you know? And so I started edging my way back on the chair, moved back, and ran out of the door. That was my experience with Christianity. 
There was one other thing with Christianity I'm just going to tell you very, very briefly. I knocked on the door of the church in Lewis. It was the biggest church in Lewis. Went in, I said, look, I need to know the purpose of life. He said, I haven't got time. <laughs> Seriously, that's the answer he gave me. So, come back on Monday morning. Went back on Monday morning. I was crying. I was about to cry. You know, because this is a very emotional thing. You know, asking, what am I doing here? You know, so the guy says to me, uh, right, okay, I've, got, I've only got 10 minutes, but go for it. What do you want? I said, what's the purpose of life? He said, hmm, right. I said, have you ever thought of doing a theology degree? I said, I've got to wait four years. In Dublin, it took four years. Trinity College, I, ch I checked it. He said, you know what? I'm really sorry, but I can't really help you. That was the answer one of these guys gave me. He said, you know what? My job is to open up the church in the morning. I let the worshippers in. In the evening, I let them out. I close the door, and that's my job. So that was the answer I got from the Christian. Finally, I had this girlfriend. It's nearly ended now. <laughs> Put yourself out of your misery. So, there I am. I've got this girlfriend. And she says to me, no, I love her very much. I don't think she loves me very much. But I love her very much, you know. I put her on a pedal stool. So she says to me, one day, Tim, tomorrow don't come here. I said, what? What do you mean, don't come? Is that what people who love each other say to each other? I said, wow. Times have changed. I said, are you serious? She said, yeah. I said, what's it all about? It's something to do with my religion. I said, well, I tell you what, your religion's wrong, man. I said, either you, that your religion's wrong or you're wrong. She said to me, she said to me, get out of here. <laughs> Don't cuss my religion. My religion is important to me. In the morning, I knocked on the door of what? The Islamic Society. She was a Muslim. The guy met him. He says to me, What can I do for you? He's wearing a khutra, Saudi type khutra, long beard, looks frightening. Just like Sarah said, you know, we, we just assumed, What is Islam? I've never heard of Islam. I can't remember hearing of Islam at all from the time that I was doing all this research for 10 years. Research, research into different ways and religions and philosophies, I didn't find any Muslim at all. Didn't know about it. And then, right at the end, there's this guy in front of me and I, I'm saying to him, look, I've got this girlfriend, I've got a problem. She's a Muslim girl, I need to know about the faith. So he says to me, you need to leave her. I said, well, that's not very good advice. I mean, I want to try and get closer to her. How am I? No, you've got to leave her. She's bad for you, and you're bad for her. <laughs> okay. So anyway, he said, look, read these books. <laughs> you know what it's like. So I didn't do coursework for the next month. <laughs> and I sat down with the books. I read. I knocked on the door, and I said, your religion is good, man. You're the problem. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I'm going to read more about this religion. So I read, and I read, and I read. And the last, what was this month? Shaha Ramadan. The month of Ramadan, the month when the Quran was revealed to mankind. Mankind. Not Pakistanis and Bengalis and Saudis. Mankind. It was revealed to mankind as a way of. Yeah, he's kicking me off now. Um, <laughs> right at the end of Ramadan, I, I fasted one day. Somebody said to me, you know, fasting is good, man. You should try it. So I, try, I fasted one day. And it was like somebody took the blindfold off my eyes. Someone took the blindfold. And then I found out later on, fasting is the only act of worship which is entirely for God. Entirely for God. And this happened in the month of Ramadan when the Quran was revealed to mankind. It happened when the gates of paradise are open. It happens when the gates of Jahannam or, or hell are closed. So from this, I kept chasing the girl. And eventually she ran away. And I found Islam. And at the last few days of Ramadan, I walked into Banan Mosque. I took Shahada, alhamdulillah. And then 300 guys hugged me, and I never hugged a man. <laughs> so that's about it. I'm really sorry if I play with this situation. But unfortunately, you don't know you've invited Yusuf Chase. 
By the way, I'm not a charity fundraiser. <laughs>